Hello everyone, this is a little tiny introduction before the video because when we were recording this video I completely forgot to switch this device on the zoom mic and so all the audio on the video sadly is from the, the iPhone, not from a, a normal mic. So it doesn't sound as good as it should. I'm really sorry. I'm a technophobe. I'm hopeless with any technology. I managed later on in the recording session to switch this on, but then accidentally deleted all the audio at the end of the session. So hopeless, hopeless. Anyway, enjoy the video. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm here with Loki, uh, as usual, and uh, he's about to listen to me playing a waltz called uh, Vals du Petit Chien, the waltz of the little dog. Uh, so it's very much in his honour. The, the reason I'm doing that is because we've just reached 30,000 subscribers today. And when this channel was very young and had 1,000 subscribers, I recorded in a ludicrous red jacket a performance of Chopin's Minute Waltz, originally called the Waltz of the Little Dog. And I'm going to do it again today. Uh, first of all, as a silly party trick, no musicality whatsoever, just sheer speed and probably not very good playing, trying to desperately get through the waltz in one minute. No musicality, it's just a silly party trick, but it's a celebratory one because we've now got to 30,000 subscribers. Thank you everybody for supporting my channel. You've all been marvellous and we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for you. So to celebrate, I'm going to play the minute waltz again, better hopefully and in one minute. And then once I've done that, the silly trick will be out the way. We'll talk about the piece properly and more seriously. So to start off with the silliness, one minute to play the minute waltz. <laughs> So, uh, now to serious business. Chopin wrote this waltz. It's his Opus 64, number one. He wrote three waltzes in 1847. He only had two years to live, so this is a piece that comes from the end of his life. And it's not typical of his late period because most of his late music is extraordinarily subtle and richly textured and quite complex. Lots of wonderful, rich, chromatic harmony and, and lots of counterpoint, lots of polyphony. Uh, this isn't any of those things really, although uh, of course it is, as all Chopin is, marvellously elegant and melodic and uh, magnificently composed for piano. But texturally it's quite simple, it's, it's just a right hand melody with a simple waltz accompaniment. Theoretically that's really what it is. The right hand, however, is a sort of moto perpetuo, so it's got a continuous a uh, run of quavers, they don't have to, they shouldn't be, the speed I was doing it. But it begins with a sort of, kind of uh, spinning motif. And then typically with Chopin, you get this mix of rhythms, because it's essentially going one, two, one, two, one, two. So there's a rhythm of two in the right hand against a rhythm of three in the right, and that's called a hemiola rhythm which basically means you've got a slow three going over the top of quick three. So you've got quick threes here, and you've got over the top, slow threes on the right hand. Uh, one, two, three, and one, two, three. Do you see how that works? It's like a slow three going over the top of a quick three. And it, this is a feature, I suppose, of the Viennese waltz too. So the Strauss father and son combo, the famous Viennese Strausses, always composed in, in hemiola rhythms and their waltzes, because hemiolas give waltzes 
loads more excitement, rhythmically speaking. And the, the kind of twirling dance is a feature of the Viennese waltz, and it is for Chopin as well. This isn't a waltz that's intended to be danced to, though. It's very much a waltz that's meant to be played at the piano. And therefore, in a term that Stravinsky once used of it, he said Chopin's waltzes are a portrait of a waltz. It's actually something that Diaghilev had once said about Ravel's La Valse, but, but Stravinsky repeated the quote about Chopin. It's sort of true that these are little miniature portraits of waltzes. And the minute waltz falls in three sections, so you've got this terrific melody sort of just hovering over the top of the right hand with all these hemiolas, and then little hints of, um, uh, of almost operatic, everything in Chopin tends to derive, or an aspect of his melodic style derives from Italian opera. So these sort of sighing phrases in the right hand are essentially operatic, as is the beautiful melody in the, in the centre of the piece. Um, it feels as if it comes out of an opera by Donizetti or something. These are the hallmarks of the popular side of Chopin's style. So I've just reached down off the piano this book called Chopin Pianists and Teachers, a fascinating book which has lots of accounts of Chopin's playing. And there's one account here of him playing this piece uh, in 1848 in his last concert in Paris. Someone's written, Chopin would compress the first four bars almost into two bars. A lot of people complain, very few on this channel, but there are a few complaints occasionally about tempo and tempo modifications and so on. But I suspect that I've never done anything as free as, as Chopin's playing was. Berlioz once said that the 3 4 of his mazurkas was really 4 4. And this accounts as something even stranger. It says Chopin would compress the first four bars almost into two bars. It should unroll like a ball of yarn, he said. The real tempo came in with the bass and the fifth bar. So if you can imagine the opening of the waltz, it appears in Chopin's rendition, he compressed the first four bar into what seems like double speed uh, in this ball of yarn thing. Let me see if I can replicate that. <laughs> It is strange, isn't it? But uh, the quirks of genius. 1847, when the waltz was written, was a difficult year for Chopin. He had had tuberculosis for about seven years. He only had two years left to live. And during this period, his relationship with the famous novelist Georges Song had been companions for several years, but it was reaching a point of strain. Chopin's declining health was part of the problem. She had almost become a carer for him, and I think she resented it. And he was a difficult guy to live with. He was morose and inclined to be snappy and, and difficult, unpredictable, difficult guy, a uh, typical, typical genius. And she was a genius too. So there was a bit of a conflict between them. So uh, 1847 was the year and Georges Sand wrote this extraordinary book called Lucrezia Floriani, in which the, the two protagonists are the same age and the same character as Chopin herself. In other words, it's a very, very thinly veiled portrait of their relationship. And it's not a very happy relationship. She's beautiful and freedom loving, and he's morose and difficult and disagreeable and terribly jealous. It is in its way, I believe, a portrait of two brilliant people in conflict two enormous egos who are really unable to share a living space. And so in writing it, she was sort of conflating her own not altogether satisfactory relationship with Chopin in a kind of fictional way. And she read it, what's more, she read it in a sort of semi-public way. Delacroix, the great French painter who was a friend of theirs, described a reading at their house. And he wrote this, I went through torment during the reading. Madame Sand felt no compunction, and Chopin took unfeigned delight in the tale. <laughs> and then within the year, their relationship had come to an end and she had left him. And poor Chopin died two years later. I'm not saying that the breakup was the reason for his death, but he was in a dwindling state of health. So it's a sad tale, but the Minute Waltz is a, a tiny little sunny moment in a, a rather sad period at the end of Chopin's life. I should say that at the end of his life, Chopin was writing masterpiece after masterpiece, a truly great composer. A truly great composer, wasn't he, Loki?